Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, Congregation Or Shalom. I'm Gary Michelson. I'm the president here at the synagogue. And uh, before we start today's program, I just have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go over. Uh, first, in the age of technology we live in, if you could please either turn off or silence your cell phones so it's not disruptive, it would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, also, uh, in the event we need to vacate the building at any point during the ceremony today, uh, there's four emergency exits. The two that we came in at over here to my right, be your left. Uh, there's one about halfway down in our social hall. It's again, there's a red exit sign. And there's a fourth over here in the corner to my immediate left. So in the rare event we need to vacate, we can do it through those four exits. I'd like to thank the Jewish Federation of the Greater New Haven and the Holocaust Remembrance Committee for allowing Congregation Or Shalom to host this year's event. I understand that this community-wide Yom HaShoah commemoration will rotate annually at, uh, throughout the Greater New Haven area, and we are thrilled to be able to host it this year. As many of you may know, there's a real deep connection between our synagogue and the yellow candles that we light on Yom HaShoah to commemorate the uh, six million uh, who lost their lives in that terrible dark time in history. Um, the late Barry Goldblatt, who was a former member of Congregation Or Shalom, was actually part of the committee, I believe it was back in the 80s, that developed the yellow candle. And it was Barry himself who actually designed the yellow candle that's now lit all over the world on Yom HaShoah. Today, Barry's son, Mitch Goldblatt, continues the tradition as the chairman of our Yellow Candle Fund here at the synagogue. The Yellow Candle Fund is fully supported by voluntary donations, and it's responsible for us being able to distribute free of charge yellow candles to all of our members each year. And we also make annual monetary donations to causes such as the New Haven Holocaust Memorial and other programs that support Holocaust remembrance. Uh, if any of you here are a member of a house of worship, doesn't have a yellow candle program or would like to start one, uh, please reach out to our office. It's a wonderful program. It's, it usually becomes self-funding uh, with donations within a year. And we are very happy to help you get set up uh, for the first time and give you all the tools and resources necessary to start one. Just reach out to our office and um, again, we'll be happy to help you. So without further ado now, I would like to pass it over to the chairperson or co-chairperson of the Holocaust uh, Memorial Found um, Commemoration, uh, Gladys Horowitz. Greetings, shalom. Thank you for being here today. My name is Gladys Deutsch Horowitz. I am pleased to have had the opportunity to co-chair this year's Yom HaShoah Community Commemoration with Lynn Brodman. We have a wonderful program in store. It is impossible to put something together like this without the input of many people, and we would like to begin by thanking those that provided support and their expertise. I would first would like to acknowledge the Holocaust Memory Committee who have been tireless in convening this event for over 40 years. The names of the current members are included in our program. Please note who they are. Lynn will speak a little more about this group in her remarks. For now, I would like to thank Stacy Dworkin and Bruce Dittman, last year's co-chairs, whose insights and advice were invaluable. Doris Zielinski has also been generously offering guidance throughout. Thank you to Michael Dimenstein, Jacob Griffith Rosenberger, and the team at the Jewish Historical Society for their input and encouragement, as well as the folks at the Towers who are an integral part of this event. The team at the Jewish Federation, Kayla Bisbee, Derek Holodak, and Wendy Bowes have been resourceful, smart, and great problem solvers. Like Lynn and I, this is the first time that Kayla and Derek have really planned this event, and yet they seem to be on top of everything. I am so happy to have gotten to know them. 
Although Wendy has been involved in the Yum Hashoah commemoration in the past, she has not worked on the display like the one we have put together this year. From the first time Lynn and I presented her with the idea, she was enthusiastic and supportive. As time went on, she may have had second thoughts. She deserves a special acknowledgement for her skill, diligence, and patience. And of course, thank you to Gail Slosberg for her fearless leadership. We are very grateful to the office crew here at Congregation or Shalom. Eileen Kaczynski and Rachel, Rachel Steg, Steiglader. I think I said it right. I am thankful for Rachel's insight into everything that needed to be done and her proactive attention to the securing, security needs for an event such, of the, such as this is of critical importance. Gary Michelson, or Shalom President, can be counted on in a heartbeat for whatever you need. That was a gift. I am deep, and I think that Eric Severs is gonna be helping us with the, with the um, technical assistance, so uh, thank you. I am deeply grateful to Rabbi Alvin Wainhouse for his sage guidance and wisdom. I have learned so much from him. Most importantly, I want to acknowledge the people who open their hearts to share their own stories and those of their families at our exhibit. Please note these badges worn by the people whose items appear in the display. So if you would like, you can speak with them after the program. Although not so easy to think about it, it is important to more memorialize the events that our people experienced. And during these difficult times, it is more important than ever to remain connected as a community. Good afternoon. We gather to rem to together to remember the Shoah. This is the Greater New Haven 46th Annual Yom HaShoah Community Commemoration. But the commemoration actually started before that. A decade before, people gathered at the old Schubert Theater. And even before that, and even before that, <laughs> Shifra and Michael Zamakov would gather with survivors on their porch to remember, to remember stories and support. So you see, our respect for this solemn event runs deep in Greater New Haven. As the years pass and first-hand accounts slip away, it is our charge, it's our obligation to keep our collective memories alive. As the years pass, it is uh, even more important that we listen. We listen and we learn. So many of us look around our homes and we have glimpses of past lives lived, objects of our family that hold memories and memories of friends who were victims of the Holocaust, who in some way played a role in our collective storytelling. They are shared precious possessions. So we asked our community, our neighbors, to share what they hold dear. The display you see is, um, is an act of love and it's an act of remembering. And our hope is that it grows. Each candlestick, prayer book, child's toy, old photograph is a reminder of a life caught, cut short, an innocence lost, a family torn apart. These objects became our connection to the past and to each other. Everyone here has a story. Some have many stories and that must be told to share and, and to teach for the Holocaust not to be forgotten. 11 million innocent souls, six of them, six million of them, pardon me, um, were Jewish. All of them, fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, we are here to remember to never forget. Our collective act as the greater community, New Haven community is to put into action the words never forget by educating and sharing. It starts with sharing stories and then the building of the New Haven Holocaust Memorial, the first built on public land in the United States. 
That memorial represents the powerful message of our responsibility to stand up and to speak for them. And we must continue every day with acts of kindness, respect, and tolerance. But we can do more. We can educate ourselves by checking out the website on the back of the program to connect you to other sites related to the Holocaust. Today, on the Yom HaShoah commemoration, we gather, we remember, and we share. And we share our powerful stories through precious possessions. And we're keeping the flame of remembrance alive for each soul lost. The new and growing exhibit connects us to the shared past, tangible proof of Jewish communities destroyed. We must never forget. Please rise as we follow the Israeli tradition and listen to the sound of the siren in memory of those who perished in the Holocaust. This will be followed by the Boy Scouts of Troop 441, hosted by B'nai Jacob, who's su supported by Evan Weiner and so many other dedicated adults who will sing with us, lead us in the Star Spangled Banner. Now the Star Spangled Banner by uh, one scout leader and one scout from Troop 41. <laughs> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam whose broad stripes and bright stars
Thank you. You may be seated. So I'm afraid you have to hear my voice for a little bit longer, unfortunately, um, Rabbi Eric Woodward from my congregation um, feels terrible, but he literally feels terrible. And so um, I will introduce him, and then I will uh, read, read something that he presented. We're pleased to have Rabbi Eric Woodward, Rabbi at Congregation Bethel Kessler Israel, to present the invocation. Having only joined my synagogue 2022, he is embraced as a spiritual le leader who guided guides with compassion and strength. So Rabbi Woodward's words. Today we are here to recall and honor the memory of those who were murdered in the Shoah. Many of us, though, have the atrocities of October 7th weighing heavily upon us. As Rabbi Yehuda Halevi wrote, in the 11th century in Spain, my heart is in the east, but I am in the farthest west. Yom HaShoah today feels different because of all this. And I want to invite us to chain, to charge us to do two contradictory things at the same time, says Rabbi Woodward. On the one hand, to engage in the Shoah memorial work completed on this on its own, and to give its own time and its own due without going in our hearts to October 7th. And on the other hand, to do so in the present, aware of the suffering of October 7th, knitting these two events together. Today, our spirituals attempt to do both, excuse me, our rituals attempt to do both, to live in two ways, simultaneously in the present and also in the world of memory. And each one of us today, at different moments, will feel connected both to the past but also to the present. That is appropriate, for this is deeply Jewish. We engage in remembering and we also work to make this world a better place. Today, may we have the strength to Zahor al Tishka to remember and to never forget and to build a world with the values of that memory, a world of love and safety and redemption. I would like to invite Mitch Goldblatt to come up to light the yellow candle. Thank you, Gladys. Thank you, Lynn, very much for this honor. Uh, Gary was kind enough to mention my dad, who helped develop this candle. The original candle was developed in a glass jar, see-through glass, so you could see the yellow wax uh, burning. Uh, of course, today, because of uh, economics. We now use a different uh, mechanism with the tin uh, holder, but I will light the candle in a second. But while I've got the podium for just 10 seconds longer, uh, Gary did welcome you to Or Shalom. I do want you to know there are three other things I thought of right in this synagogue that make us remember the Holocaust all the time. Behind me in the ark, we have a Holocaust memorial scroll, which the rabbi brings out on special occasions, such as yesterday as well as Yom Kippur, we bring out that, that uh, scroll to read from the Holocaust Memorial, the Holocaust scroll. Second of all, you notice around you all the Yortzite plaques. There is one up there on the right-hand upper corner. There's a Yortzite plaque for the six million in this synagogue. And then the entrance, you, you all came in. Just as you came in, there's a plaque on the wall that does recognize the six million. So we think about what we're talking about today all the time in this shul. Thank you. I'm gonna light the candle at this time to remember those who perished in the Holocaust.
Thank you, Mitch. We would like now to invite any Holocaust survivors that are here and also members of the um, Holocaust Memory Committee to come up to light um, one of the candles for the sick that remember the um, six million Jews who were lost in the Holocaust. So please, if you have been on, served on that committee or you were a survivor and would like to come up to light a candle, please do that now. We'd also like to take a picture. Um, so after you're done, if you would stay up here so we can have a picture of you, that would be lovely. Last of our candles, we would like to invite um, to signify light in the darkness. This um, candle represents the continued struggle for a new generation. And um, we have some local students who we would like to invite up right now to light these uh, candles, the three candles. One candle. Sorry, one candle. Thank you. Can you tell us your names? I didn't hear one. Righteous Among Nations, I would like to um, invite up Gustav Gus Keech Longo, um, Director at the Towers. 
we have a flower a flower for you to put in the vase no no I'm sorry. And now, to honor the liberators of the concentration camps in, in Europe, um, I would like to invite up Normal, Norman Feitelson to place a flower in the vase. One more candle, um, Stacy, Stacy Dittman and Bruce, uh, Stacy Dworkin and Bruce Dittman, in recognition of those killed and captured uh, in the October seventh massacre in Israel and since. Next, I want to change the program just a smidgen to accommodate. Um, we're delighted to have the mayor of the city of New Haven with us today here to present a proclamation. So if I just ask um, Mayor Elliger, if you wouldn't mind coming in and joining us and sharing a few thoughts as we contemplate this day. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here and giving me the opportunity to uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for having me and uh, giving me the opportunity to um, to share with you uh, reflections. Uh, it, it's a trying time uh, for the Jewish community. Uh, I don't need to tell any of you here that uh, in New Haven and around the world, uh, in particular with the ongoing conflict in Israel and Gaza and with the troubling rise of anti-Semitism that we are seeing in uh, many uh, locations, including in uh, our local community. Uh, today on, on Yom HaShoah, it's important that we remember and reflect, and we say never again. Uh, that's a, uh, a phrase that I think you'll hear many times uh, today. We remember the over six million Jewish people who were murdered during the Holocaust, the men, women, and children who perished the horrific atrocities that were committed, the ethnic and racial cleansing perpetrated by the Nazi regime. We remember their descendants who, were, who we still grieve and are still impacted by their passing. We remember the resolve of the Jewish people who persevered through it all and their fight to survive, to live, and to flourish again, which we see ongoing today. We reflect on what we can do here and now, today, to eradicate bigotry and hate from our hearts, from our homes, from our city, from our country, from our world. We reflect on tikkun alam, how we can help repair the world through everyday acts of justice, kindness, love, and peace. And we say, never again. Never again will we allow such atrocity to happen to the Jewish people or to any group of people. We say hate has no home in New Haven, and we condemn it and confront it in all forms, whether it be anti-Semitism or other acts of hate that have surfaced in recent years, be it anti-Muslim hate, anti-Asian hate, anti-LGBT hate. I wanna thank the Gru Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven for helping organize this event, and it is my great honor to read and present this proclamation to you from the city of New Haven, commemorating Yom HaShoah. Whereas in 1933 to 1945, during World War II, more than six million Jewish people were murdered in the Nazi Holocaust as part of a systematic state-sponsored genocide with millions of men, women, and children perishing as vic victims of Nazism and racial cleansing. Whereas the residents of New Haven paused 
to recognize the atrocities committed, so such horrors are never repeated again. We collectively mourn the death suffered and strive to pursue true equality that uplifts all and forsakes none. Whereas the universal resolve, the residents of New Haven dedicate themselves to principles of international justice for all and condemn discrimination in any manifestation or treacherous conduct context at this moment of reflection. Yarzeit and insight. Whereas pursuant to an act of Congress, May 5th, 2024, has been designated a day of remembrance of victims of Nazi Holocaust. And New Haven and countless other communities throughout the United States and world jointly commemorate this day of observance, also known as Yom HaShoah, to mourn the death and destruction of countless innocents and proclaim, proclaim never again. Now, therefore, do I, as mayor of the city of New Haven, in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and of other deaths stemming from anti-Semitism, fervently hope that all peoples and nations will strive to overcome bigotry and acts of inhumanity through mutual respect, education, and justice, and hereby proclaim this day, May 5th, 2024, as a day of remembrance. Thank you. I just want to say a, a great thank you to Mayor Elliker. Mayor Elliker has always been at our Yom HaShoah uh, service, and he has been a great champion and a friend, uh, someone who has stood against anti-Semitism, both he's, and he stood with us before October 7th, after October 7th, today and every day after. And we're grateful for his friendship and his clear guidance and his clear moral guidance in these difficult times. So thank you so much, Mayor. It's always an honor to have you with us. We'd like to ask Miriam Ramadi to come up, please. And I hope I haven't put you on the spot. Do you follow the clock in order? You are amazing. I know. <laughs> Yet oh, another. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, Miriam will recite the in, in Yiddish first, and we'll follow by joining her in English. These I will remember. Miriam is a daughter of Hannah Cooperstock, who was a Holocaust survivor and also an Israeli soldier during the War of Independence. Not, she's way too young, pardon me. Elle eskera, mir wollen sei gedenken mit der hellige Fort. No mir zinden Licht, noch to six million hellige Leuterne Schommes, welche seinen gegangen al Kiddush Hashem. Der verschnittene Lebens von Frauen und Männer, das, was der Sonne hat vertilgt, die umschuldigen Kinder, wenn es lichtige Augen der Erzieher hat ausgeloschen. Alle, die, was seinen umgebracht gewordenen Gaskammern und in Karzers, ausgegangen in die Gassen von Balagate Ghettos, die, was seinen ausgegangenen Flammen, geworfen geworden in Kevorem, Leberdigkeit und was seinen Umgekommen mit die gräuslichste Mises und uns seines Gesahr. Wir wollen euch nicht vergessen, Sachor wer alt ich kach pisch nein, soll abgemerkt werden der Nomen und das Gedächtnis von die Mörder, Schänder und Verschwächer von menschlichen Mien. Zachor et asher asa lecha amalek. Lo mer euch gedenken und nicht vergessen die Verschwörung von Stillschwein von der Welt. Wenn der Sonne hat gespreit, Verwüstung und Teut, hat die Welt geschwiegen mit herzlosen Gleichgilt und hat Heil Efscher mit Stille Hanoi. Blind seine Gewänsere Eugen, teub seine Euren, stumm 
der Zung und Stein sehr Herz. Ob hätten wir, wenn mir dem heiligen Ondeck von unsere Kedoschen, le adei ad olam. We will remember them with a holy sense of awe. Let us light candles for the six million innocent souls who died for the name of the Lord, for the lives of men and women who were exterminated by the enemy, the innocent children whose bright eyes were extinguished by the murderer, all who were in gas chambers and in trenches, liquidated in the streets of besieged ghettos, those who were lost in flames and thrown alive into graves, and those who suffered gruesome deaths under an enemy's fateful sentence. We will also not forget Zachor ve'al tishkach pishnaim. Remember and do not forget doubly. Let the names and the memory of the murderers be erased, those who disgraced and demeaned the human race. Remember what Amalek did to you. Let us also remember and not forget the conspiracy of silence throughout the world. While the enemy spread devastation and death, the world was silent with heartless unconcern, and some perhaps with quiet satisfaction. Their eyes were blind, their tongues silent, and they had hearts of stone. We will preserve the holy memory of our martyrs forever and ever. Thank you. I am very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Daphne Geismar. Daphne will be sharing the story of her family who went into hiding in the Netherlands during the war, as recounted in her book, The Invisible Years. It is amazing that a treasure trove of her family's diaries, documents, photographs, and objects, or as she has referred to it, the miracle in the drawer, eventually found its way to Daphne, or she to it. As she is an award-winning book designer, and has produced books for major museums, including the Met, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts. In addition to writing and design work, Daphne has extended her commitment by teaching high school students, and she is currently teaching a class on genocide at E.O. Smith High School in Stores, using the invisible years as a text. We are thrilled that two students from that class Gracelyn Pear and Pines Talon Wenzel will be participating in her presentation. Learning about the past has the potential of helping us to avoid the same mistakes in the future. It seems this can't happen fast enough. On a personal note, I met Daphne through JCAR, the Jewish Community Alliance for, Refu for Refugee Resettlement, a co-sponsor of IRIS. She has been thoughtful and creative as she helps newly arrived refugees learn the essential skills needed when starting life in a new country. She also is co-chair of the Employment Task Force. Daphne really shared a very interesting insight that she had about her work with JCAR. It turns out that after the war, her grandfather worked with a resettlement agency in the Netherlands where he helped re relocating Germans find employment. It was only after she began vol volunteering that she made this connection and realized that her focus on helping refugees find jobs was perhaps not a random coincidence. Daphne recently spent a week in Montreal where her family story will be included in the permanent exhibit at the new Holocaust Museum that is currently being built there. Without further ado, I would like to present Daphne Geismar. Is this microphone working? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gladys, wherever you went, for that thoughtful 
and really personal introduction. <clears throat> um, I want to reintroduce Pines, Talon Wenzel, and Gracelyn Pear, students from E.O. Smith High School in Mansfield, Connecticut. Last fall, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with them and their classmates in collaboration with their teacher, Joe Goldman, in his genocide studies class. It's an honor to be here to remember together. I'm here with Pines and Gracelyn to tell the stories of my family members' experiences under Nazi occupation in the Netherlands and to briefly show how we work with these stories in the classroom. My deep dive into this history began when I learned that my grandparents, Chaim and Fifi Dezuta, were hidden in a church attic in Rotterdam for two years. After visiting the church in 2006, I returned to the United States and I asked my mother to tell me more. My deep dive into this history began when I learned that my grandparents, Chaim and Fifi Dezuta, were hidden in a church attic. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> My mother led me to an antique desk and opened the bottom drawer. It was filled with my family members' letters, diaries, and documents about their experiences during the Holocaust. These are some of the over 50 primary sources pulled from the drawers that make up the narrative in my book, as well as some of the photographs and artifacts. The eight family members who left us their writings became the narrators of my book, Invisible Years. And the lining paper at the bottom of my mother's Holocaust drawer became the end papers of my book. The narrators are the Dezuta family, my maternal grandparents, Chaim and Fifi Dezuta, with their three young daughters. Miriam is my mother in the middle, and her sisters, Hadassah, and Judith. My uncle, Natan Cohen. <clears throat> and my father and grandfather, David and Erwin Geismar. Here are all eight narrators. My grandparents were in their early 40s when the Germans occupied the Netherlands. My mother, father, aunts, and uncle were children when the war started. When I first read through my family members' accounts, I realized that no one person had the complete story, but their collective accounts made it whole. My family members offered different perspectives on shared experiences. So what I ended up doing was I cut up everyone's accounts, created content groupings, and then sequenced the groupings and excerpts within them to create a single narrative. When I first read the interwoven voices, it was like my family members were speaking to me, to one another, and to whoever reads the book. By listening to these conversations, I finally understood how the genocide happened and how my family members felt when they lost their rights, freedom, identity, and the people they loved. That's when I put my head on the table and wept and when I knew I had to share their stories with anyone who would listen. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I tell the students that my focus is my family story and they are Jewish but it's important to know that in addition to the planned mass murder of the Jews in Europe, the Nazis also wanted to destroy Roma, Slavs, LGBTQ people, Jehovah's Witnesses, people with physical or intellectual disabilities, and political opponents. In the first four chapters, which are titled Before, Trapped, Forbidden, and Separated, the narrators coexist in their homes and communities. So in the book, their voices are interwoven. In the section titled Invisible, the narrator is going to hiding separately. They're isolated from one another, and so their voices are separate. When the narrators come out of hiding, they are reunited in the chapter titled After, and their voices are interwoven again. 
Hitler's goal was to remove Jews from Dutch society so he could make the Netherlands and its Aryan population part of Germany. The removal, removal of Jews happened over a two-year period. Slowly, the Nazi civil administration prohibited Jews from work, school, public places, transportation, communication, owning property, associating with non-Jews, and so much more. Deporting them to concentration camps was then just one more step. The chapter titled Forbidden groups anti-Jewish orders like those I just listed with the eight narrator's accounts of how each discriminatory law affected their lives. Here are a few excerpts from the book. April 15th, 1941. Jews are given two weeks notice to surrender their radios. May 1st, 1941. Jewish professionals such as doctors, dentists, and lawyers are forbidden from serving non-Jewish clients. June 4th, 1941. Jews are prohibited from using public beaches and swimming baths and attending public markets. After radios were confiscated in spring 1941 and we were prohibited from cafes and bars in the summer, Jews could not travel without a permit. We were told we had to do things and we did them. The Germans were the people who could take you away and put you in prison. You did what you were told. We wondered, why are we losing everything when we are no different from our friends who aren't Jewish? In August 1941, just before the school year was to start, Jewish children were forbidden from attending public schools. This is a photograph of my mother Miriam's class before the occupation. She's in the second row wearing the flower, the dark colored flower print dress. Her parents, Chaim and Fifi, made arrangements for the girls to go to an improvised school with Jewish teachers. Miriam's opinion about this? We were about to be murdered by the Nazis, and our parents were still worried about our education. In the spring of 1942, Jews were ordered to wear a Jewish star on their clothing. We found my Aunt Judith's star in her Holocaust drawer, with a book that she hid the star in. Judith's father, Chaim, had told her to throw her jacket with a star in the river on her way to her first hiding address. Remember, she was 10 years old but Judith forgot and then realized the danger of having the star with her in hiding. Mary and Dave, Miriam and David told us how they felt about wearing the star. You were a non-person, a person people didn't want to associate with. You were different. Maybe you, maybe you are bad because the Germans said Jews are bad. It makes you feel like you are nothing. We were marked. On July 5th, 1942, summons were sent to 4,000 Jews to report for transports to concentration camps in the East. Jews had few options for escape. One month later, 2,000 Jews were rounded up. Raids increased as Jews went into hiding rather than show up for transport. A relatively small and dedicated number of non-Jewish Dutch citizens resisted the German occupation. Their activities included hiding 28,000 Jews, although 40,000 were looking for hiding places. On August 19, 1942, the Dezuta girls, ages 9, 10, and 11, left their parents and each other to go into hiding. Their cousins, Hetty and Miriam, in this photograph that you're looking at, reported for transport with their parents. <coughs> My father was amazing. He planned and insisted that we hide. He just totally saw that the whole thing was very dark and he was obviously right. My mother's sister, Yet, and her husband thought that as long as we did exactly what the Germans said, then we'd be okay. They went when they were told to go for transport. They went with their two kids, including their oldest daughter, my best friend, who had the same name as me. They went, and they never came back. In 
Perhaps, and uh, maybe most likely, the non-Jewish world never fully comprehended the cruelty towards citizens by the Nazi regime. They took everything from us Jews, even the last penny and our homes. Then they deported us, from 14-day-old uh, infants to 90-year-old men. In the chapter titled Invisible, we learn about the narrator's long-term hiding places, where they were invisible for more than two years. This timeline summarizes what is happening at parallel moments with the narrators, the politics, society, and the war. A map of the hiding addresses for the eight narrators follows the opener of this chapter. In total, the map shows 27 documented hiding addresses for these eight family members. When parents and children separated and went into hiding, they were isolated from the world and one another. And so this is where the structure of the book changes. The narrator's voices are no longer interwoven. Each has a separate hiding chapter where they tell about their unique experiences. Some could never leave their hiding places, others hid in plain sight. There were Nazi raids on two hiding places. My maternal grandparents were not discovered, my paternal grandfather was. Most protectors were remarkable humanitarians, but some were not. Before going into hiding, the three Dizuta girls had their braids cut and names changed. We kissed and hugged each other goodbye. Don't cry, I was told. Everything had to look as normal as possible. Looking back now, I realize how much more awful it must have been for my parents to have to send their children away, not knowing how we would be treated or even if they would ever see us again. Miriam wrote about the sleeping arrangements at the home of Nal Van Fleet, where she hid with three other Jewish children. For a short while, we slept in regular beds in different rooms. Then the Germans started to unexpectedly search homes for hidden weapons, hidden Jews, and hidden pilots. It became too dangerous at night. The four of us had to sleep under the kitchen floor because you couldn't get to a hiding place fast enough. Every night at seven for the remaining years of the war, more than two years, we said goodnight and the four of us went down into our little night prison. It was always the same, in the same, in the same, in the same, in the same. All of the Dizuta girls had to change hiding places multiple times. Their parents lost track of where they were. They sometimes suffered from lack of food and were always in danger. When Judith had to leave the home where she was hiding with three older women because of increased raids in the neighborhood, she was taken to a farm owned by a family with eight children, not knowing the abuse that she was about to endure. When Judith realized our book would be published, she made the difficult decision to share her complete story. This is Judith's teddy bear that she had with her in hiding. Seven years after I visited the Rotterdam church for the first time in 2006 and learned about the Holocaust drawer, I found this drawing that my grandfather made of his hiding place in the church. It accompanied his account of a terrifying Nazi raid that took place in April 1945. My grandparents had been hiding in the attic for two years at that point and would be liberated the following month. Chaim wrote a detailed account of the raid. Here is an excerpt. I hear someone walking through the church, so I go over to the window from where the organist has a full view. Carefully, I hold the edge of the uh, opaque green curtain against the wall and use my finger to create a small crack, only to grow rigid with fear. On the podium below me, between the pews, there are two green police walking around, searching everything. And then comes the stage of paralysis, the sense that all is lost. When I was at the church in 2006, I stood in the organ loft where my grandfather stood 61 years earlier. During a moment alone, I pulled back the curtain to look into the nave, just as my grandfather had when he saw the Nazi police searching between the pews. The 
There's still a small chance. Now the super he heavy ladder still has to be raised. It can't be done hand over hand because that would make the ladder sway and bump. Throw it up, let it go, and catch it again, 10 centimeters at a time. One slip and that's the end, for the Germans are already below me in the foyer. I close the trap door and cover the cracks with a cloth. Seventy-five percent of Jews in the Netherlands were murdered. The majority of those who survived did so by hiding. Seven of the eight narrators of Invisible Years survived. My grandfather, Erwin, was captured in hiding and murdered in Auschwitz. When the seven come out of hiding and are reunited in the chapter titled After, their voices are interwoven again. Finally, in May 1945, the Canadians came to Harlem. That night, for the first time, all four of us could go outside without fear. Friendly soldiers on trucks and tanks, no one screaming at us, no one was pointing a gun at us. Five years of horror were over. Whoops. June 20th, 1945 was the first time the five of us slept in a house of our own again. You can hardly comprehend that our family emerged from that hell in one piece. They emerged, but the lives they had no longer existed. Other people were living in their homes. Years of education were lost. They couldn't relate to their old friends or family members. And David's father, Erwin, didn't return. The top row is from before the 1940 German occupation the bottom row after the 1945 liberation. They went in as children and came out as adults. We really didn't know how bad things were until after the war. Then came the really sad times. Many people were waiting for their family, their husbands, their children to come back, and they didn't come back. Every time they heard about someone who didn't come back, my parents were crying, and they were always whispering. Everything was sad, and you felt guilty because you didn't get killed. After the war, my grandfather Chaim wrote a letter to his three daughters in an effort to make sense of life after the Holocaust. Here's just a very little bit. When we were free once again, it was as if life itself had been put back into our hands, for our very life had been stripped from us. Gladness and gratitude overwhelmed me. Gratitude to all who supported us during the war years, and an emotion of thankfulness that I will call divine. But this feeling was almost immediately stifled, remembering just one of the millions of children who had not returned. Surely, countless ones among them must have been a thousand times more deserving than we. A few years ago, a film was discovered that brought the happy pre-war Zuta girls to life. Watching it was amazing. These are words from my grandfather Erwin's memoir written shortly before he was murdered in Auschwitz. In the end, I hope that my lines will be read by people who will see how we struggled under terrible circumstances and that the reader will want to take up the struggle that we, fought, that we have fought and experienced from the front lines for the construction of a worthwhile, humane society. After my book was published, I wanted to turn it into a classroom experience. I'm going to take just a few minutes to give you a really brief look at the project. The first teacher that I collaborated with was Colleen Sousa from Fairfield Ludlow High School. Colleen turned Irwin's words into an essential question for our project. 
How can we study the struggles fought and experienced by others in order to construct a more worthwhile and humane society? We taught 10 sessions divided into three parts. First, students use the narratives from invisible years to get a better understanding of the Holocaust through their personal experiences. Second, we have a conversation about modern anti-Semitism and other forms of hate. We want the students to recognize it and to, meaning, and to meaningfully speak out in a way that is authentic to them. And third, students do research on a modern human rights conflict of their choice. At our final gathering, we connect back to this essential question when students identify patterns that exist between different human rights events. In the first class, students gather in small groups to carry out a reading of the narrator's interwoven voices. The process is really similar to what the way Pines and Graceland were reading here today, but in the class, there's much more text and more interaction between the narrators, and we have all the narrators um, reading together. It's, the process is really similar to reading a play. After reading out loud in a group, many students said this was the first time they were impacted by the horror and reality of the Holocaust. They said things like, this is real. They are human. This happened. One student said, we are reading for them, speaking for them. They are in our body. After the group reading, students choose one of the narrators, one that they particularly connect with, to follow into hiding. When students turn to, turn to their narrator's stories and photographs and artifacts to ask questions, they see how this can lead them to information that they didn't even necessarily know that they didn't know, which then prompts additional questions. The process allows students to approach a complex subject like the Holocaust with thoughtfulness and, vig and rigor. Some of the students' questions are used in an interview with my cousins and me. It is emotional and intense, and students are totally engaged because they are so prepared with good questions, and they know and care about the people involved at that point. Other questions are used for research from which students create history briefs that provide historical context for the personal narratives. When we saw how deeply the students connected with the narrators, we asked them, what would you say to your narrator if you could? Gracelyn and Pines are going to share their letters with you. Erwin. The fact you won't be able to read this makes this writing both infinitely less meaningful and infinitely more meaningful. Words cannot describe the grief I felt when I read your last piece of writing, and yet your words still echo throughout my head. In those final moments, you hope that there is something greater, that people will fight for a worthwhile society, and I lament that I'm unable to speak to you face to face, as I think there would be a worthwhile conversation there. When I read your writing, I find striking similarities in how you write to my late grandfather. A sort of comforting level of directness, and that may genuinely be why I have been so fascinated by the bits and memories you have left behind. Reading those last words over and over, it hits me that while strides have been made, the groups that were persecuted during the war still to this day are persecuted, just in different ways. Yet the mirror is there. The amount of falsehoods spread about the Jewish populace, the ablest ideas thrown into about every medium, the still active stripping of rights from queer populations. I wonder what you would think of all of it. It's sobering looking at the writing of both you and the rest of your family, how I would have been in a similar situation had I been in Europe at the time. I would have had a massive target upon my back as my father is Jewish. I am queer, I am a communist, well, a Marxist, but yet again, I doubt that would have mattered to the Nazis. And looking at the state of the world now, where groups that hold Hitler upon a pedestal still exist, namely the KKK, the fact that they exist and thrive in some places pains me. I hope that you have peace in whatever form of an afterlife exists, and I hope you can truly rest, Mr. Geismar. May your final wishes on paper come true. Thank you, Pines, and now Gracelyn.
Dear Miriam, my name is Gracelyn Pear, and I have been learning about your family and the events that you went through during World War II. I have read many of your writings and reflections about your life during that time, and it, and it has been eye-opening to me. With some of the things you wrote about, I honestly can't believe that they happened and that there were over 100,000 people who were also persecuted in the Netherlands. I just read about your reflection on the day you became free. The relief that I assume came over you must have felt incredible. You wrote, you didn't have to be scared anymore. I have learned about the Holocaust many times during history classes, but this has been different learning about you and your family and knowing these are the true events that happened during that time to a specific family. It is hard to think that you were truly scared for your life. When it finally came time to see your sisters and eventually your parents again, it must have been such a unique experience and for sure one that you will never forget. I can't imagine being away from my sister and parents for three years, never mind the fear of not knowing if you would ever see them again and if they were alive. It also must have been so hard seeing what they looked like and knowing that they went through such a challenging and scary time, not knowing if they would survive themselves. I'm sure you had those thoughts too. You wrote a little bit about what it was like after the war was over and what that and what hard times wait. You wrote a little bit about what it was like after the war was over and what the families went through, not knowing if their loved ones were alive. You had said how hard it was to see your parents get emotional. For me, I know how weird it can be seeing my parents cry. That must have been such an interesting and very hard thing to go through, giving your parents the time they needed to grieve over their loved ones. You must have felt so lucky to know that unlike many others, all of your siblings and both of your parents survived and you were reunited. I was wondering what it was like for you to make the decision to not return to school and leave home to go to Israel. It must have been hard with your mom and how she was not really there for you after the war and that she dealt with her grief by taking sleeping pills. After you arrived in Israel, I think it is amazing how you started working and made a life for yourself even if you weren't with your family. It also must have been nice once your sisters arrived in Israel to have them there with you. It is also kind of cool how both you and your sisters met your husbands later in Israel and that they both had been hiding in the Netherlands. Even after so much trauma and times of uncertainty, you made a life for yourself. Your story has made an impact on my life and made me appreciate what I have. Thank you for sharing your story. Sincerely, Gracelyn. Thank you so much, Pines and, and Graceland. It um, is really moving and remarkable to me to see how these two incredible people connect with the stories um, that we're all here today to tell. Um, so I wanna thank you so much for being here with me and all of us today to remember together. I'm delighted that my family members' stories live on and that they've had an impact on both of you and the other students that I've worked with. This spread from my book remembers the names of my 61 relatives who were murdered. Pines and Gracelyn, your deep thinking and ability to see each person in a un as a unique individual worthy of living in a humane society gives me hope. Thank you. the spiritual leader at Or Shalom for over 40 years. He is the powerful force and creator of the community-wide Crystal Knock program, honoring the righteous who helped to save so many Jews during World War II. He will sing the partisan song, followed by the song of the song. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Thank you so much, and a uh, profound thank you to the, um, to the Yom HaShoah Commemoration uh, Committee, um, to Lynn, to Gladys, and it's just so moving to, uh, to see you all here today at Or Shalom. This is a great idea. This should rotate from shul to shul throughout the greater New Haven area. I see you nodding in approval, Mitch. I, yes, this is wonderful, and, um, and may it continue. Um, and to Darabat, to uh, kudos to our own committee here at Or Shalom, the, who assisted the Yom HaShoah committee. <clears throat> um, as, mo as many of you know, I grew up speaking Yiddish. Yiddish was my first language, actually. And um, I remember hearing this partisan song as a kid. The partisan song, uh, which is, um, was created by those amazingly brave young men and women in the forests of Europe, expresses unbelievably optimism, hope, confidence that there's a better life, a better world on the other side of this war. And the keynote is Mir Zainan Dob, because after all, we survived. The, these songs, these partisan songs, especially this one, the most famous of all the songs, were composed by young people, I mean 15-year-olds, 16, 17-year-olds, who managed to escape to the forests of Europe and, uh, and created fighting units. Did the Jews fight back? Yes, these songs represent their fighting spirit. So if you know the song, please join with me. <clears throat> the pollen has gotten to my vocal cords, so I'm a little hoarse. Zognit ke molas du dem letzten weg. Never say you walk the last road. Never ever say that you're walking the last way. Zognit ke molas du dem letzten weg. Vin himlen blayen e farstellen bloye teg. Weil kumen wet noch unser eus gebenkte show. Sveta poikton unser trok mir seinen do. Weil kumen wet noch unser eus gebenkte show. Sveta poikton unser trot mir seinen do. Mir seinen do means we are here. Fun grain in palmen land bis weissen land von schnee. Mir seinen do mit unser pein mit unser wei. Und wo gefallen ist dieser Spritz von unser blut. Veta sprotz ton unser gwurre unser mut. Und wo gefallen ist dieser Spritz von unser blut. Veta sprotz ton unser gwurre unser mut. Tu so nit kein molas du geis dem letzten weg. Wenn himlen bleiene verstellen bloie teg. Weil kumen wet noch unser eus gebenkte scho. Sveta poikt on unser trot mir seinen do. Weil kumen wet noch unser eus gebenkte scho. Sveta poikt on unser trot mir seinen do. Mir seinen do. <coughs> I've been asked to chant Psalm 121, Esau Enai. Shall I move into that immediately? Yeah. And these words were composed about three and a half thousand years before that song was, was composed. Uh, it's one of the Psalms of the Bible. And uh, I have in my hand a book that I bring to these uh, gatherings every year. This is an amazing book, uh, actually given to me by Ted Rogel. Do you remember Ted Rogel? Of course you do, Mitch. <laughs> And um, may he rest in peace, all of us show him. And he said, Rabbi, we're liquidating our library. We're moving to, to join with Or Shalom. The Derby Synagogue is joining with Or Shalom. And would you take this book? It's a, I'm not sure what it is. It seems to have a lot of Yiddish in it. I don't know who would understand it. And I read the introduction and I asked a few experts. This was a, this was a, a prayer book, a Sidur translated into Yiddish and with a complete commentary, not just a translation, uh, for women who did not receive a formal education. Most Yiddish-speaking women in Eastern Europe barely received the Jewish education, and so this would help them understand the meaning of the prayer. So this is Psalm 
121, which I chant in three languages. Shir Lama Alois. I write these words as I ascend to the mountain, to Mount Zion, looking for answers to questions which circulate within my heart. Shir Lama Alois. Eso einai el horim. I lift my eyes to these mountains, asking again and again, what is the source of my help? Ich hoib euf meine Eugen zu die Berg zu sehen von wannen wird kommen mein Hilf. Aber ich hob nicht von keinem Hilf, kein Hilf nor von Gott allein. Was hat beschaffen Himmel und Erd, my power, my strength shall come from the one who brought these mountains and hills into being. Ezri meyim adonai, I say shemayim vores, the power who brought heaven and earth into existence. Al yitain lamot raglecha, who will not allow you to stumble. Your guardian will not slumber. Indeed, the guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Al yitain lamot raglecha, al yonum shemarecha, God der hiter from Yisrael. Tut kein mol ni dremlin, un ich lof, n I don't know, yehine lo yunumvula yishon. Shomer Yisrael, indeed the guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is your guardian, your shelter at your side. Yomer Mashem esh lo yakecho, v'yoreyach baloi lo. By tog v'dihitz fun der zun dich nit mazik zayin. Und bei der Nacht wird dich nicht massig sein, die Levoner, und euch schmort sich zu Hovecho, mei Atovia doilom. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you against all evil and guard you body and soul. The Lord will guard your going out and coming in. From this time forth and forevermore, and euch schmort sich zu Hovecho, euch schmort es nafshecho, und euch schmort sich zu Hovecho, May I tell the other Lord, God, that the hidden from all and basin, and that hidden thine life, God, that the hidden in thine eyes gain in vain and in thine coming from hind bis ebig and so many sorgen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Wayne House. We will now be ending our program. Three more things. Um, Re, uh, Cantor Kohava, Kohava, yes. Kohava. Kohava Monroe will be leading us in El Male Rachamim, after which Andy, Andy Sarkani will be leading us in the Kaddish, and then we will sing together Hatikva. When the program is over, please join us in the back in the social hall where um, Daphne's book will be available for sale and she'll be signing. And um, also people who, if you look for the badge, as I mentioned before, will be, um, will be available if you would like to speak to them. And please take another look at our display. Thank you again for coming. I'll invite us to rise for Amale Rachamim, the memorial prayer. El male rachamim, shochen ma meromim, hametzei menucha nechona, tachat kanfei hashechina. Malot Kedoshimu Teori Kezohar Harakia Masiri Lenishmot Kol Achinu Mene Israel Shenit Mechuma Shova Anashim Nashim Shenachneku, Veshen Nisrefu, Veshen Neherku, 
together the English translation. God, full of mercy, who dwells on high, grant proper rest under the wings of the divine presence in the lofty levels of the holy and pure ones who shine like the glory of the firmament for the soul of our brothers, the Jewish people, the holy and pure, who fell at the hands of murderers, whose blood was spilled in Auschwitz, in Majdanek, in Treblinka, and the other camps of destruction in Europe, who were slain, burned, and slaughtered, and who were buried alive with extreme cruelty for the sanctification of the divine name. For we, their sons, their daughters, their brothers, and their sisters, will contribute to charity and remembrance of their souls, May their resting place be in paradise. Therefore, may the master of mercy shelter them beneath his wings for eternity. And may he bind their souls in the bond of life. God is their inheritance, and may they repose in peace in their resting place. Now let us say, Amen. Let us say Kaddish together. Yiskalal, by Yiskalash, Shemir Rabo, the Olmo Divro Hivute, the Amlik Marhute, the Chayakon of Emekon, highly called Beit Israel, Bagala Vizman, Korib, the Blue Amen. The Hei Shemir Rabo Mevorat, the Alam Rame and Mayo. His Vorat, Vishabat, Vispoar, Vishraman, Vishnase. Vishadar, Vishalal, Shemek, Vishab, Rahu, Leil, Amikad, Birata, Vishirata, Tushbata, Vanamata, Damir, Ambalmo, Vibru, Omein, the Heish, Ramurava, Mishamaya, Haim, Alenu, the Akoi, Israel, Vibru, Omein, O Sesharam, Vimbuma, Puya, Sesharam, Alenu, the Akoi, Israel, Vibru, Omein. You would be seated just for a moment. For those of you that I, I don't know or who don't know me, my name is Gail Slosberg. I'm the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven. And I thank you all for being here this morning. I think for a lot of us, especially since October 7th, our hearts are very heavy. And we've felt a lot of despair. I was at Schubert last night, and someone I'd never met before was wearing a hostage tag like I do every day. And we looked at each other and caught each other's eye across the room. She held hers up and I held mine up. And we came together. She gave me a big hug. She said, who are you? I said, who are you? We didn't know each other. And she hugged me. She said to me, I'm so upset. I feel so alone. And I wanted to just share with you that there are a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people in our community who are feeling really alone. And I'm so grateful that we can all come together and be here today to remember the history and the horrors and the lessons and the memories of the people who perished during the Holocaust. 
But I also want to share with you something else, because every day people do it, say this to me, and it happened when I walked in today. Gail, how are you? Are you okay? I'm good. I'm okay. We're okay. Because although we see these student protests on TV and we hear the things that they're screaming and we recoil in horror and they hear the echoes of the 1960s, we see and hear the dark shadow of the 1930s. But I want to share with you, we are not in 1930s Germany. We may feel it. We have to be vigilant. We need to be strong. But we have something now that Daphne's grandparents didn't have. We have Israel. We have Israel. So please, reach out. Don't be afraid. Talk to people with the love that's in your heart, because that's who we are. We are a peaceful people who pray for peace, Ose Shalom Bim Romav, every day, many times a day. And remember our strength. Remember that we have leaders that support us. We have a mayor. We have leaders that support us. I have a citation from Woodbridge, Connecticut, so please make sure if you speak to anybody from Woodbridge, we have a citation from them as well. But know that we have support. We have each other. We have Israel. We have an Israel Defense Force, for, Defense Force, IDF. Together we are strong. We will continue to speak up, to speak out. And we will not see 1930s Germany, Europe again. Am Yisrael Chai, thank you for being here. V'yachad ninatzeach, together we will prevail. Now I'd like to, I'd like to ask Kanter Kochava to please lead us in Hatikva. Rise and we'll sing together. <laughs> Thank you again so much for being together as a community. Shalom. <laughs>